It presents most often as a painless lump in the neck. Although differentiated thyroid cancer is uncommon, its incidence appears to be increasing, and it most often affects young women in their 30s. What are the treatment options? We're pleased to have an endocrine surgeon joining us on this week's Health Talk to educate us. So don't go away, we're up next. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Our guest on this week's Health Talk is a surgeon who specializes in the treatment of endocrine tumors. I'd like to welcome Dr. Susanna Vargas Pinto to the show. She'll share an overview of differentiated thyroid cancer. It's great to have you on the show. Yes, thank you for having and me. And welcome to Norwalk, welcome to New Vance. I know that you're one of the newer physicians here, Susanna. That's and uh, I hope you love this place the way I did. Uh, as you know, I worked here for over 20 years. So, so tell you, you're an endocrine surgeon. Right. It's a, it's a very specialized, very uh, particular type of surgery. Tell us, what is endocrine surgery and why did you pick that as a specialty? Uh, yes, thank you, Eric, for having me. Um, endocrine surgery, it's a specialty. It comes from general surgery, but we focus on the surgical treatment of tumors related to mainly the thyroid, the parathyroid glands, and the adrenal glands. Um, some endocrine surgeons are actually trained in managing pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but that's mostly now done by surgical oncologists, so our area has diverged a little bit from that. Um, we do cancer treatments and we do benign tumors as well. Um, I actually decided that I wanted to become an endocrine surgeon. Back in medical school, one of our classmates, she ended up being diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And I wasn't really keen to any specialty itself because I kind of like a little bit about everything. Um, so one of my earlier rotations was actually with a head and neck surgeon who he did a lot of endocrine surgery. And I just fell in love with the thyroid anatomy. Um, I fell in love with the parathyroids, the physiology and everything that you have to it's like a little puzzle that you have to put together before actually performing the procedure. So. And only a true scientist can fall in love with the thyroid and the parathyroid glands. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> so, so tell, you know, we have a, a lay audience at home. Tell us a little bit, what are the thyroid, we'll talk, we're going to talk mainly about thyroids this segment, but tell us, what is the thyroid gland, where is it, what good is it to us, so, to give us all the information. Yes, so the thyroid gland, it's a butterfly-shaped little organs right here in the anterior neck. Um, and it performs a wide variety of um, activities. It basically helps us regulate our metabolism. So our weight, um, our energy levels, um, even our hair, even um, things like our, our bowel movements, it's involved in a lot of, of things. You know, a lot of people think that they're, they have low thyroid because they gain weight. Uh, I know that having a low thyroid, you can gain weight, Yes. but most people who gain weight, it has nothing to do with their thyroid. Correct, event. yes, correct. So uh, it's a good excuse, but it's usually wrong. <laughs> yes. So what type of disorders do you see as a surgeon? As an internist, I'm, I guess, very conscious of both overactive and underactive thyroids, yes. uh, both of which can have definite symptoms and uh, both of which are quite treatable. But as a surgeon, it's a little bit different orientation, isn't it? Yes. So we see patients who have perfectly normal thyroid function, but they, their thyroid just has a large growth that is putting pressure on their airway or it's making it difficult for them to swallow. Um, that's one of the kind of patients we see. We also see patients who are known to have thyroid nodules, but they don't have a definitive diagnosis. And sometimes not even molecular testing can help us. So we offer them surgery um, so we can provide a definitive diagnosis. Yeah, some people don't realize that. I think that sort of the standard of care, and you can please correct me because I'm often talking out of older medical practice, mm -hmm. uh, used to be for a thyroid nodule that is not obviously malignant, uh, for one reason or another, they'll put a needle in it and draw out some cells and yes. some fluid and look at the cells and the fluid and try to differentiate benign from malignant that way. But the, the, the gold standard really is to take the nodule, a big piece of that nodule, and examine it under the microscope and molecularly, and that's where the surgeon would come in. 
So it's a little bit more invasive, but it's also more definitive in terms of the diagnosis. Yes, y yes, you're perfectly fine. Uh, we can also, I've had a couple of patients also that come to us for educational purposes. Um, because most of the time people will tell them, yes, you can see the surgeon and they think they're gonna have surgery, but not necessarily that's the best option for them. Um, so we are prepared to discuss all the options, including surveillance with ultrasounds, molecular testing versus surgery. So let's, let's talk a little bit from the patient's perspective. Uh, how do, what do they notice first? Many patients don't notice anything. Um, the majority what, what should we tell our audience to look for? <laughs> If you have any lump on your neck um, that you notice that it's starting to grow or it causes some pain or you just feel that it's hard, you should probably get that checked out uh, by your primary care physician. You know, I think a lot of people may not know that really where their thyroid is and it's sort of above the, the, the notch of your sternum here yes. and you can feel it when you swallow too. So sometimes that lump will come up and hit your fingers. Yes. Um, and I know that some people with thyroid cancer can also present with a hard lymph node um, on this. So lumps in your neck, how do you differ? Because let's, 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 I'm sitting at home thinking, my God, everybody's got lymph nodes in their neck. Yes. Everybody's going to, and they're, they're all going to be running in to see their doctor. <laughs> how, wh what's a dangerous lump and what's a normal lymph node for, the, for people at home? So all of us, we all have lymph nodes. Um, if we get some sort of infection, respiratory or a sore throat, our lymph nodes in the neck are gonna swell. Um, so that's perfectly normal. It's it, a normal part of the immune it's system. It's a normal part of the immune system and it may take a couple of weeks for them to come down. But if you haven't had a recent infection um, and you start to notice a lump that it's growing, it's hard, it doesn't move or it just feels like it's not um, regular, then those nodes are they don't have good characteristics, so they should be checked out by a doctor. Yeah. And, and the benign thyroid lumps, or pretty nodules as we call them, are pretty common too. So it doesn't, just because you feel a lump, it doesn't yes. mean you've got cancer. Correct, yes. Pretty much a lot of people have thyroid nodules, and for the most part, 90% of them are gonna be benign, and most of the time we don't need to do anything about them. And as you, you alluded to the fact too that uh, Lymph nodes have a characteristic sort of rubbery feel to them and they, they move, you can squig them all around with yes. your fingers and uh, they're, they're not hard and they're not fixed. Uh, they, they, again, you can tend to move them around under the skin. Whereas the lumps we're worried about tend to be harder and tend to be fixed. So I think that's an important message for folks at home. And certainly anything that's growing uh, and, and not getting better after an infection, you wanna have looked at. Most likely benign, but you know, don't be, we don't want to be foolish because the therapies are really quite good. So tell us, somebody comes to you with a, a lump mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the primary care physician feels that it needs to be investigated. Yes. Uh, do, do you do some of the, 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 the investigation or do they come only after they've had the biopsy and the, the scans and all of that? We see everyone. Um, most of the time the patients come with their workup done. Uh, but I've had patients that we help the primary care physicians. Um, so tell so, us what you do for a lump. Yes, for this lump, the first thing we will do will be a dedicated ultrasound of the neck. Uh, we wanna see if it's a soft tissue mass, we wanna see how does it look, does it look suspicious, does it look benign, um, is there blood vessels feeding it, or any other concerning features. The second thing that we will do is we will, make your we will measure your thyroid hormone levels because we want to make sure that whatever we're seeing, we need to know if it's an overactive mm -hmm. nodule or not. Um, if some of these are benign, but they autonomously produce thyroid correct. hormone. Correct. And for those, if it's just one nodule that it's autonomously producing hormones, we tend to offer surgery for that as well. Because then, and you explain why, rather than have me, yes. well, you, why, why take out a, benign but overactive nodule that's flooding your system with thyroid hormone. Yeah, so in the long term, the excess uh, thyroid hormones are, they can cause damage to your heart um, and they can also affect your mood, make you feel restless, poor sleep. Uh, we're mostly worried about heart effects on the long term and we're sparing the patients to actually be on long term antithyroid medications that can potentially also damage their liver. Oh. Um, so it is an option, but 
if it's something that you can excise and the patient does not have to be on medication forever, um, I think that's a great benefit for a surgery. And are you using minimally invasive surgery for a lot of these things now? I mean, it's a relatively small area to work in anyway. Yes. So I use very small incisions. I, I do my surgeries open, um, but the incisions are small. They're usually about four centimeters or three centimeters. We're not the traditional six centimeter, eight centimeter incision. So that people can have a, they don't look like they've been strung up by a rope after they're done. <laughs> right. They're done with that. Right. Um, so that, and should people be afraid of this surgery in any way? Uh, they shouldn't. The surgery is very safe, even for patients who are on blood thinners. Um, we take a lot of precautions during the surgery. Um, we use an intraoperative nerve monitor to make sure that the nerve that goes to the vocal cords is being monitored. Now that's an important point, because I certainly learned about this in medical school, that the thyroid gland has an intimate relationship with one of the nerves that goes to your vocal cord. Correct. And that's really the, the thing you have to watch out for the most, isn't it, when you, when you operate? You don't want to damage that nerve. Yes, you don't want to damage that nerve and you don't want to um, damage the parathyroids that are behind the thyroid capsule. Uh-huh. And uh, so when you have these things out, are you done? <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes not. Tell, tell us more about that. Yes. So for most patients, um, the management of thyroid cancer has changed in recent years. Okay, so yeah, now we're going to shift to thyroid cancer because we really do have just a few minutes left. Yeah. And uh, thyroid cancer is a, is I remember was always one of the surgically curable cancers. So we're talking about well-differentiated thyroid cancer. Yes. And I remember even uh, learning, and please correct me if it's changed, but even a, a met metastatic thyroid cancer that involved a lymph node or two in the neck, surgically, the, these are the well-differentiated ones. We could take them out and the patient was often cured. Yes, uh, they have excellent survival, over 90% in seven to 10 years. Now, we, we were still talking before the show, there's some data that the, the incidence of these thyroid cancers are increasing, and they also seem to affect young women more than any other group. Any explanation for any of that? So part of the community feels like there is a hormonal influence uh, from the estrogen levels. Uh, that's one of the theories. Most people agree that because we're doing more frequent imaging for other things, these tumors have been picked up earlier and that's how people have been diagnosed. Um, but it's also true that tumors from every size um, are also increasing in incidence. So we don't have a 100% clear idea of what's going on. It seems to be a combination of multiple things. So I guess sort of the bottom line is patients should examine their own necks. Correct. They really should have their necks examined by their primary care physicians, which should be part of the, the routine exam. And yes. uh, whatever you find is probably can be managed quite successfully. Yes. By a good surgeon. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that, that's great. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I can't believe it. And uh, so we have to end the interview. I want to thank you for joining me on the show today and let folks know at home that if you have questions or comments, contact us at healthtalk at newvancehealth.org. Coronavirus isn't over. We still have to slow the spread and do our part. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. 145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100. And I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough journey. 
Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm coming back. Ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. Hi. Parathyroidism is a condition caused by overactive parathyroid glands. Excess parathyroid hormone or parathormone raises blood calcium and causes osteoporosis, kidney stones, frequent urination, bone pain, depression, and malaise. On this week's Health Talk, we'll discuss this condition and the treatments that are available with an expert in the field. So please stay tuned. We're coming up next. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Our topic today is hyperparathyroidism. My guest is Dr. Susanna Vargas Pinto. She's an endocrine surgeon who specializes in the surgical treatment of endocrine gland disorders. She'll provide us with an overview of hyperparathyroidism. And we'll talk a little bit about the treatments. So, Susanna, this is a disease I suspect a lot of people don't know a lot about. They know people have heard a lot about hyperthyroidism. Yes. And I guess we just point out the parathyroid glands are tiny little glands that sit in the thyroid and that's why they're called parathyroid, but otherwise I don't think their endocrine function has much to do with the thyroid gland at all. They have their own independent endocrine function. So tell us what they do. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, thank you, Eric, for having me. Um, yes, the parathyroids are just, for most patients have four little glands. They're about the size of a grain of rice, so they're extremely small, and they usually lie behind or attached to the thyroid capsule. Their main function is just to regulate our blood calcium levels. That's, and they, they play the principal role in reg regulating calcium, don't they? Yes, yes. So th this is a big deal in terms of our, our normal uh, well-being because calcium plays a, an enormous role in almost everything, in neural signaling and uh, in bone formation and all sorts of stuff. So right. that, that's sort of amazing. These are, so, so how do you end up Let's talk about when they're overactive. What I, I mentioned some of the symptoms in the T's, but what, are, what, what do people feel when their parathyroid glands are overactive? So patient can, patients can feel different things, um, but most patients are gonna feel tired. Um, most patients are gonna feel like they cannot focus, they can concentrate, they may feel a little bit irritable, they may have trouble sleeping. Um, those neurocognitive symptoms are usually in the mild forms. And this is from high blood calcium. And this is right? from high blood calcium, right? So, so what we're really seeing here almost entirely is the par too much parathormone results in high blood calcium and the symptoms are a result of the high blood calcium. I remember in medical school, what was it, uh, bones, groans, abdominal bones or and something? Bones. <laughs> and bones. And bones. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the, the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism. Yes. Because I, I guess, and kidney stones because you're producing too much calcium. Right. Uh, I know you, I'm sure you urinate a lot because calcium interferes with the resorption of water yes. uh, in the kidney. So there are lots of different symptoms uh, that may not be clearly re related to, you may not think of the parathyroid gland first. So how do we make that diagnosis? Most patients, uh, believe it or not, they will be found to have an elevated calcium level on blood work, just your physical exam. So, so that's, that's the entry into the, the parathyroid. There that's are other things I know that can cause a high blood calcium. Um, and they measure parathyroid hormone levels, is that? So unfortunately they don't. And um, that is something that probably should be checked. Um, yes, there are other causes of hypercalcemia, some cancer, some perineoplastic syndromes, but for most people, it's probably gonna be a tumor of one of their parathyroid glands. So the PTH, is that something they can feel oftentimes? No, unfortunately they can't unless it's a huge tumor. Because you mentioned the parathyroid glands are the size of a piece of rice. Yes. Which is, is really strange. I didn't, actually didn't realize they were quite that small. As a surgeon, when you're operating on the thyroid gland, can you actually see the parathyroid glands within them? And yes. How do they look different? I, can't, I, can't, I really can't imagine seeing well, them. Well, I, I use magnification loops. Um, that's the only way to like uh, try to find them because they also look like little pieces of fat. So 
it is difficult. You have to do the surgery routinely to get used to the appearance no, of I the I remember a lot of, uh, again, this is back in earlier in my career when people were taking out thyroids right and left. Uh, a lot of times the patients were, the parathyroids were inadvertently <laughs> removed with the thyroid gland and the patients ended up sort of struggling with low, low blood calcium the rest yes. of their lives. Yes. So now you're able to work around that and save the parathyroid, if you're operating on the thyroid gland, you're able to protect the parathyroid gland? Yes, that's definitely one of our goals, yes. So tell, take us through it. Somebody has blood calcium, high blood calcium levels. Uh, take us through, not the whole workup, but the workup that results in diagnosing a, an abnormality of the parathyroid gland. Do they do imaging next uh, of, the, of the neck and is, do you actually see enlargement of the parathyroid glands? Yes, yeah, so the first, the first step is a biochemical diagnosis. So we can actually determine just by blood work. Um, we want to make sure that we know their renal function. We want to make sure that we know their magnesium levels, their phosphate levels, and other electrolytes as well. Um, and the most important thing is the parathyroid hormone level. If the parathyroid hormone level is elevated with elevated calcium level, that's pretty much what you need to make the diagnosis. And if we're considering surgery, then we start with the imaging to try to see where this tumor is. Again, for a while, I remember they used to do some venous sampling, too, as a way of uh, detecting which side. Uh, is that still done, or has that pretty much been fallen off the face of the earth? Um, it's fallen off the face of the earth, except on patients that have had multiple surgeries in the past, uh -huh. or that you just cannot find it on imaging. So you're actually looking on imaging. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the imaging then. Is it uh, MRI? What kind of imaging do you use? So we use imaging to try to find where the tumor. Ideally, you want two studies that they can correlate to each other. Um, I start with an ultrasound. If it's a lower gland, you can probably see it. If it's a higher gland, you may not see it. Um, we have CT scans with IV contrast. It's a special protocol to lighten up the parathyroids. Um, that'll be my second study of choice. But if we have renal patients or patients that can't, are allergic to iodine contrast, then we have a nuclear medicine study that we basically inject you with a radioisotope and we wait for it to light up in a couple of hours. So imaging has really become the, the diagnostic uh, approach to determining which parathyroid gland is affected. Yeah, the reason is because we want to offer the patient a focused parathyroidectomy if we can, That's in order right, to minimize get... the risks of the uh -huh. surgery. Are, are the glands, are these enlarged overactive parathyroid glands, are they cancerous in the sense that they metastasize or is it just that one gland loses control and sort of just produces too much hormone? So almost never this is cancer, pretty much 0.1% of all the glands are cancer. It's pretty much glands that they just keep growing and producing excessive hormone levels. So they've sort of lost the normal feedback control yes. that we all live, live by in most of our hormones. <laughs> yes. So that's really interesting. So, uh, so, and is it usually just one of the four glands that's going crazy? 85% of the patients, that's the problem, one gland. And so that leaves that open then to surgical resection, right? Right. Because if you take out that one gland, uh, presumably there's enough function left in the other three yes. to maintain a normal parathyroid function? Yes, you only need one that really? functions so, normally to keep your blood levels regulated. So, so, the, so yeah. the key is to be able to see, see that when you operate. See that one, remove that one, then give a couple of days for the other ones to kind of wake up and start functioning and then your calcium levels should yeah, That was going to be down. my next question. Because usually when one organ over functions and it turns off others, it takes a little bit while for those organs to, to kick yes. back on. It's a couple of days? Yes, it's a couple of days if it's one gland. Sometimes if you have to remove more than because some patients have um, hyperplasia, which is just enlargement of all glands. So for those patients, if you need to take three or a little bit more of three, then it takes, it could take up to two weeks for those glands to start kicking in. And in that interim, I presume you're watching their blood calcium because you're worried that they're going to 
but guess we could fall too low? Yes, so we always give calcium supplementation. Uh -huh. We just measure their parathyroid hormone levels to determine how much they need so we don't give them excess calcium and they don't have side effects from it. Now, tell, tell me, again, I find it fascinating, as a surgeon, you're, you're really dealing with these tiny little <laughs> things and you're trying to preserve preserve them again. I, I would just remember how difficult that used to be. What do you think ha, has made that more possible? Is it uh, better magnification? Is it better tools? Well, you know, why are, why are you able to do this now? Uh, one, better tools. Two, because we have better imaging. That's definitely key. So you know what you're going after. So we're, we know where we need to go. And that really focuses the amount of time that you spend looking for it um, and also the operation time. Mm -hmm. And what's the recovery like for the patients? Most patients do very well. Uh, they do feel like they have a sore throat. And it's mostly from the intubation. They probably... That means putting the tube down your throat while... Putting the tube Which yeah, happens in so many throat. general surgeries. Right. Um, and their, ho their voice can be hoarse for a couple of days. Uh -huh. um, many patients feel tired after the general anesthesia, but in a couple of days, they tend to do very well. Is this an outpatient procedure? It's an outpatient procedure. Uh, so, so much has gone to outpatient. It's really, yes. <laughs> really amazing. And uh, what is, what is, are there any surprises you've ever encountered in uh, doing this type of surgery? Oh, yes. <laughs> to tell, to, you know, what, what kinds of things do you run into that you didn't expect? Um, so sometimes you see one gland or the gland that you see in the imaging, you remove it and the parathyroid hormone levels don't go down. So there could be a second gland that is not as big or it was just not visible in imaging, that's one. Um, sometimes the tumors are much larger than what you think and, or they're cystic and solid so it's a little bit more difficult to remove them. Um, I have removed what I thought was a parathyroid gland and then it was a lymph node and it came back with thyroid cancer. Wow. <laughs> and the patient had no nodules on ultrasound. Wow. So that was, I what think. Did you take up the thyroid after that? <laughs> what did you do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to send him back for more yeah. imaging. Uh, we repeated a second ultrasound. Didn't see anything whatsoever on the thyroid, but he had metastasis. Wow. So then after that, uh, we, yeah, we did a thyroidectomy. <laughs> for him. And then replace the thyroid yes. hormone afterwards. Yes. Uh, can we replace parathormone? Can we replace parathyroid hormone? I know we can replace ah. thyroid hormone. Parathormone is a very different kind of hormone, though. Even though the name is similar, it's a protein. It's not a, it's not a, a chemical the way thyroid hormone is. Yes. So there is a product which is an injection um, that it's a recombinant, a synthetic parathyroid hormone that we used to give patients when they, they are hypoparathyroid, meaning their blood calcium levels are always low. Unfortunately, that has been recalled by the FDA for over a year now. Really? They had issues with the production, so right now we don't have it. Maybe in a year from now it will come back. There's nothing, the, technically there's no reason we shouldn't be able to produce that. Yeah. Uh, we've got less than a minute left. Uh, just how common is, is hyperparathyroidism? It, it is common. Um, I just personally think it's underdiagnosed. We see a lot of patients that ended up having high calcium levels for years, and it wasn't until they develop osteoporosis or a kidney stone that they come to us, unfortunately. So that's an important point. So, because we do see a lot of patients with calcium levels I don't barely above normal, but it's, can, yeah. but it's persistent. You think all those patients should be worked out uh, for uh, hyperparathyroidism? I think they should. I think they should. There, there is a benefit on preventing the sequelae of this. Right, and there were a lot of sequelae, as we said, in terms of your bones and your kidney stones yes. and kidney function. And unfortunately, that's all we have time. That's a fascinating topic. We're out of time for now. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Susanna Vargas Pinto, for joining me on Health Talk today. Uh, also, to thank you for watching. Please share your questions and comments with us at healthtalk at newvancehealth.org. One in three American adults has prediabetes, but more than 80% don't know they have it. The good news is prediabetes can be reversed. And for many people, healthy changes in their daily routine can make a big difference. Take the one minute risk test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. I have to slow the spread. 
and do our part. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov.